Hey, everybody. Welcome. It is now the, what is it? The 6th of May? Dad gummit. <laughs> How many weeks is this? That will be a question later on. We'll ask that question. And maybe we'll give away one of Jack's Starbucks cards. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm volunteering his Starbucks cards. Sure. Uh, you guys know what to do. Um, hit the Q&A for questions. We've already got a few that have come in. So thank you very much. Um, and we will do the best that we can to get those things on the front end. Hit us in the chat if you want to harass us. Um, we are going to deal with some of the tax implications that we know or anticipate based on the tax plan. So, you know, I'm wearing my Uncle Sam is coming for you t-shirt. <laughs> so, uh, and then we will get into uh, some more questions on PPP and whatever you guys want to talk about, quite frankly, we are here for you. We are not coming for you. We are here for you. So, all right, Adam, I know you've got uh, thoughts. So why don't you launch into some overview on the, the tax plan as we know it? Let my tirade begin. <laughs> now, um, actually, I do have kind of a tirade to begin. Um, so I'm sorry, Gary um, and our participants. But um, I had an opportunity to speak with David Borax, um, who, if you didn't know, is with NPR. He used to run DavidsonNews.net um, up here. So I've, I've gotten to know him over the last several years um, pretty well. So he, I haven't listened to the story yet, but he just ran a story on um, Duke Energy and how they don't pay any taxes. Just David, they don't pay any taxes. So part of this whole tax plan that we're going to talk about is you see, you know, Corporations need to pay their fair share. We need to close the loopholes. Corporations need to pay their fair share. And when you look into the, the Department of the Treasury has published a report that shows, you know, how much um, corporations pay, you know, relative to how much wage earners pay in terms of tax revenues. And, you know, assuming the graphs can be believed, there has been a growing disparity between those two sources of revenue. Corporations going way down, um, wages going way up as a percentage of, you know, paying into the U.S. tax system. So David's question, you know, really was, hey, you know, validate why Duke Energy doesn't pay taxes. <laughs> and I haven't been, um, you know, I haven't been in that kind of corporate um, tax world or consulting for a long, long time. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go check out their annual um report because that's going to disclose how they don't pay any taxes. <laughs> They'll provide a very nice roadmap for me. So here's, here's the problem um, is that, you know, they didn't, they didn't do anything shady or anything illegal, obviously. It's like, look, the reason they didn't pay any taxes, <laughs> you know, really came from two primary sources. <laughs> um, source number one was accelerated appreciation. It's what we all take advantage of, you know, buy a piece of equipment, have the ability to expense it immediately instead of over the typical 5, 10, 15 years that generally accepted accounting principles um, would, would have you uh, deduct something over. That was component number one. Component number two was, um, you know, there's a production credit for producing energy efficient power. Um, per kilowatt hour. So if you just think about, well, how did Duke Energy benefit from all the above? You had to buy the equipment to produce the energy efficient power. <laughs> so you got the accelerated appreciation too, and then you got a tax credit for producing it. So when I told David, I said, look, you know, after I started reading through this, I know that I, I, I say that I'm a libertarian. I'm beginning to think that maybe I'm an agnostic. I don't believe in anybody or anything anymore. Um, or maybe I just can't know. And he goes, no, actually, it sounds like you're starting to be a journalist. <laughs> uh, my, my point saying is that, look, if it's a Republican administration, it's, oh my gosh, we got to do more for businesses. Let's incentivize them to buy more equipment, but they need to pay their fair share. If it's a Democratic Im administration, hey, you know, we need more green power, but they need to pay their fair share. They're both offering an incentive. <laughs> That, that drives the corporate tax rate down to zero. So here's where the problem really comes up for us as US tax paying 
wage earners or bit or small business owners that don't have all this stuff. So if you look on Duke and I'm not, again, I'm not knocking Duke. They provide my power. I'm happy that my lights came on today. I'm um, great company employ a lot of people, but if you look on their balance sheet, um, there's a number that's called deferred tax liability. So if you call up Duke Energy and they say, hey man, how'd you pay no taxes? They would say, oh, you're using perfectly accepted, you know, tax principles that were used to incentivize behavior because that's all tax, you know, code really is, is to incentivize behavior. But, you know, at some point we're going to need to pay those taxes. That's why we have this deferred tax liability. Um, so I'll give out one of Jack Starbucks card if anybody can get even close to what the deferred tax liability is for um, Duke Energy. But I'll put it this way, um, Jack, if all of a sudden Duke Energy was to, like if we eliminated all of these um, accelerated tax things or energy credits, and all of a sudden Duke Energy bill, Duke Energy's tax bill became you know, they had to pay their fair share for the current year, which they make a billion dollars a year and not even freaking close, Joe, try again. Um, <laughs> that's a billion. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, that's just what they earn. Their deferred tax liability is way better than that. <laughs> so if they, if they suddenly, if all these tax preferences just stop tomorrow and they not only had to pay their fair share of corporate income, but then they had to pay that twice just to bleed off this deferred tax liability over time, how long do you think it would take? Um, beyond my lifetime. At yeah, that's lifetime. actually correct. It would take <laughs> over 50 years. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I'm going to live to a little bit over 100. So and so I'm going to be um, I may see it. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, oh, we're going to have to pay these tax, these tax liabilities at some point in the future. I'll boo-hoo us, you know. 50 years <laughs> if it all stopped that's assuming that i have no ability to add to it <laughs> or change it <laughs> yes joe it is beyond your lifetime <laughs> so the the answer is so joe, jack's going to give gift cards to everybody no the answer is <laughs> they have, they have, a nine, they have a they have a nine billion bn nine billion dollar deferred tax liability um, so they have kicked, so all the clients that we have, they're like, man, I'm worried about my deferred tax liability because we've been kicking the can on all this stuff for a long time with appreciation. Well, you're a good company because Duke Energy is at $9 billion <laughs> currently. Um, so then if you extrapolate that out to all the other companies that have deferred tax liabilities, that's a lot of freaking money. Um, so I just, you know, I, so I, I guess my cynicism is that, you know, when they talk about closing the loopholes, they're not going to change anything about depreciation. They're not going to change anything about incentivizing green energy tax credits. So are they really going to solve anything? But all that said, um, in terms of the tax law changes that are being proposed, you know, the, the, the first bucket is, hey, let's put some more money in the IRS's pocket to go after enforcement. Um, some of our clients have asked the question, oh my God, you know, should I be worried about that? My answer is no. Um, so knock on wood, you know, most of our audits are no change audits if you're a BGW client. So my stepbrother is a BGW client and I was having his planning call with him the other day and he said, hey man, I, I did this investment. You know, it's kind of a hard money loan situation. Um, is there anything that I can do about that income? And I said, no. He goes, well, I was talking to a buddy of mine that did the same investment. His accountant told him that if they didn't issue a 1099, just don't claim the income. <laughs> I said, Kurt, <laughs> you can't do that. My point in saying that is that when we talk about enforcement, that's the kind of enforcement they're talking about. <laughs> Not the Duke Energy use perfectly acceptable legal means <laughs> to create a $9 billion tax liability. So I, I just feel like our clients are gonna have a whole lot to um, worry about because we do, you know, we try really hard to keep our clients aggressive, but honest. Um, so that, I think that's the most likely is just enforcing the laws that we currently have on the books. You know, most estimates of that number is $1 trillion a year. 
one tr that's with a T, Jack. That's a TR. <laughs> trillion dollars a year. Um, just if they if they up the number of audits and went after underreported um, income. So that that's number one. You know, bucket number two um, is the elimination of um, stuff that have to do with the state taxes. So basically, you know, if if Jack dies today and he's got, you know, five million dollars in built in capital in unrealized capital gains that he then leaves to Gary. Um, Thank you, Jack. Gary. Gary gets a step up in basis. He'll never have to pay those capital gains tax that Jack would have had to have paid had he sold the stock before he died. They're talking about eliminating that in addition to um, some other, I'm just talking about the stuff that's really could impact our client base. Talking about eliminating that um, in addition to, you know, lowering the estate tax level a bit. So that, that could be a big hit, but then again, it's dead people. So, you know, if you've got a compromise, you know, compromising around dead voters um, seems like, in other words, I don't see a lot of disagreement on let's enforce the laws that are on the books and let's tax the dead people. <laughs> um, so then when you start getting into the painful stuff, the painful stuff that's going to be the most relevant to our client base, um, you know, one is, you know, just on wages, you know, if you make above 400 grand and talking about kicking in the social security tax again at the full 12 and a half percent, that'd be a big deal um, for a lot of people. Uh, so that's one. The second is on basic, for all intents and purpose, like kind of exchanges would go away on real estate transactions. They're talking about having a $500,000 exemption level. Um, but after that, no more like kind of exchanges. I mean, I'm likely that would go retroactive to 1031s that are already done. Um, but, you know, that that would be a big hit to a lot of our clients because most of our clients do real estate transactions, do a 1031. And then the biggest one is that in tandem with potentially changing the corporate income tax rate, which by the way, remember what I just said, won't make a damn bit of difference if they don't do anything about all the other stuff. But they're talking about changing the corporate income tax rate. Um, they're also talking about, you know, effectively repealing most of the elements of the Tax Cuts and Job Act, Jobs Act, well, the big piece for all of us in that would be to eliminate the qualified business income deduction, which is the paying the 80 cents on the dollar on your K-1 flow through income at above $400,000. So that would be, that would be a pretty, that would be serious. Um, so um, if we all have the ability to contribute to Joe Manchin's campaign coffers, um, to say, hey man, we're with you on this. Don't do a whole lot about taxes. Just enforce the stuff on the loop, on the books. And if you want to do something about taxes, go after the dead people. Um, we should consider a donation uh, to Joe Manchin. Um, so that's a big stuff that I had uh, for this week. I guess the only other thing that I'd add is North Carolina. You know, write any senator that you have. You know, they kind of went the opposite direction. The House said, hey, we should be able to deduct those PPP expenses. The Senate, instead of taking up the House bill, doubled down and said, no, we double want to make sure that you can't. Basically, everything the House did, they just put a bill in committee to do the exact opposite. <laughs> so way to go, guys. Um, so with that in mind, I will punt to Jack. Well, OK, so a couple things. First, Gary, don't tell my wife and kids that I wrote you into the will. So um, that would create some problems. All right. It's just between us. <laughs> and and um, to manage your expectations, the number is not nearly that number. So, you know, it's really close to nothing. So all good. Um, all right, before you guys go into uh, the, the kind of um, what we talked about, what intended discussing today on tax issues so I can sit back and just listen, I wanted to um, dispel uh, a few rumors and go through some numbers, which is that, yes, the money has run out. Um, no, the money for you has not run out. The money for people who have not applied has run out. That's what that is about. That happened um, a couple of days ago. So there still is money in the pot for a couple of things. Most pertinently, for those that have these errors that have occurred through the processing, the, the algorithms, et cetera, that have put your potential, your potentially put your application 
on hold until they work this out. So the money is still there for that purpose. And then there are, um, there's other money out there that is uh, allocated to these community financial institutions. So there's $8 billion set aside for that. Now, those are for um, businesses in underserved communities, essentially. So, uh, and then um, the, the, the error code pot of money is about $6 billion. So there's plenty of funds out there if you haven't received it and that, you, um, that there's problems for that. There are other pots of money that we wanna remind you about, which is the, um, the restaurant revitalization fund actually helped the client earlier this week get through the numbers and, and process that actually several clients and uh, the thing about that though is it, it, for the first 21 days that they open the portal it's for disadvantaged business entities um, women veterans socially and economically disadvantaged people so this was a, a women-owned business that I helped get through that and then the shuttered venue operations grant is back open $16 billion in that pot of money. And then there's also, again, ones that crop up locally, either here in Charlotte or locally where you are. There's state funds, county funds, there's private foundation funds. So uh, I am uh, counsel for nonprofit organizations that handle money that are, are implementing money from donors into this system of uh, providing for loan money, recovery money, et cetera, outside of the SBA program. So, you know, if, if there are plenty of, I should say there are several pots out there that if, uh, and, and then obviously the employee tax credit uh, that's out there as well. So, you know, continue to look and, and don't stop looking because there's new stuff that comes online uh, every day in uh, locally, geographically, regionally, nationally. So just wanted to share those few thoughts. Yeah, and awesome. I think I've, I've had a lot of clients that have asked, thanks, Jack. I've had a lot of clients um, that have asked, switching back to the tax law change, proposed tax law changes. A lot of clients have asked, well, is there anything that I should be doing or anything that I could do? Um, the answer to that is um, yes, kind of. Um, I wouldn't make anything permanent, but if you're just reading the tea leaves in terms of, hey, you know, directionally, you know, what dog will probably hunt on this and what could you do about it based on what we're seeing today? Um, we do have a lot of clients that are either going through sales um, or contemplating sales of their companies. A lot of those are going to be on an installment basis, meaning that they're basically going to act as the bank and receive payments. Well, if you look at the um, the, the tax law that Biden's proposing, basically he wants to jack up the capital gains tax rate if you're over a million. So a lot of our clients, I mean, you know, you may not feel like you're a millionaire, but you really are one, you know, when you consider your company value as a component of that. So I think, you know, the first thing you do can do preemptively is that you're, con if you're contemplating a, um, a, a transaction, you know, provide for the flexibility to re-amortize the installment note to get you to below that million dollar number. Because, you know, if you're on an installment sale, you're generally recognizing um, income um, as you get paid. So if you keep it below a million, you can keep the existing current capital gains rate in place if that passes. Or alternatively, you can make an election on an installment sale to go ahead and have the whole thing taxed up front so that, that would be a reason to potentially accelerate a sell. And then to, even if you're having to be the bank, front load the tax payment so all the taxes are paid and out of the way um, right up front. So that, that's one thing you can do preemptively. The other thing is um, on, the estate, on, uh, on the estate tax, step up in basis, capital gains. I mean, you know, I've said it a million times to our clients. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. The perfectly logical answer when it comes to estate tax planning is to die with nothing and maintain control of everything up until that minute. <laughs> and that's totally possible, <laughs> but, it, but it requires that you actually do something. And do something is called 
get crap out of your name <laughs> prior to you dying. So, you know, I think it's also the time to, you know, even, even for, you know, young people, I mean, you know, I'm 47, um, you know, I, I got my own problems, <laughs> you know, with this particular matter. Um, if something um, were to happen to me and the estate tax law changes um, down to what I think it's going to change to. So a lot of our clients have this issue um, potentially. So it's, it's time to, you know, if you have one kind of 2021 resolution, it would be, hey, I really want to get this whole um, stuff in my name versus stuff in my not, not, not in my name gifting thing um, sorted out. Outside of that, until we see what passes, I mean, there's really not anything else that, that you can do proactively or be or to be prepared other than those two items. Oh, I guess the last thing would be, you know, if you were thinking 1031 was going to be your strategy for deferring a real estate gain, that strategy is off the table. So we're going to have to come up with something new. And, and I would add a, a, a caveat to that too, is that, you know, as you're considering your own estate planning per plan, that it be a generational thing. So if you're on the older side of things, children, uh, you know, encourage them. I've, I've, the clients that we've brought in here and I've brought into our estate planning group, it's okay. Tell me, uh, you know, about your kids, tell me about your parents. And, you know, to, uh, if, if you have desires to provide a benefit for your grandchildren, then, you know, let's talk about how that is efficient because I agree with the statement that, uh, and I've used that before that your goal is to, uh, control everything and, and, um, basically own nothing uh, up until that point. So um, consider, consider that generationally uh, your parents and your children as well if you have influence over them to get them to start thinking about that stuff. And sometimes it's a difficult conversation to have, especially with parents. So totally get it. So you guys ready to dive into some questions? Oh, and can I make one clarification? Actually, yeah. David caught this, which was, Yes, the, the portal for the restaurant fund is open, but they will only approve the minority owned or the disadvantaged business entities for that priority period of time. So um, per what we said last week, which was, hey, it's opening up this week. Yes, if you're in that category, go ahead and apply, but don't expect that there's going to be much of anything happening on your application unless you fall into that disadvantaged class. So David, thank you for that clarification that I misspoke disadvantaged uh class includes it is typically um minorities women uh we have and, and there's different classifications or, or different types of businesses you'll see those in the construction industry you'll see those we have represent some of the franchisees at the airport that are uh airport concessionaire disadvantaged business entities so you see various acronyms dbs uh, those kind of things so um those are the ones that they're looking for and are very specific as to when you fill out the application and you're gonna to have to verify that. And uh, I guess since we're on that, let me clarify that in that you have to have functional control, not just be named uh, and be the owners of. So in other words, if there are provisions in your bylaws or your shareholders agreement or your operating agreement that do not give the minority the, the minority, let's say it's, it's women, there's two, two women and, and one guy. If the two women own 51% or more, but the, the male has some power, including veto power over certain things, that's gonna be a problem for your qualification, not just for this program, but in general. So, you know, for those that are, uh, and, and we've had in certification processes, the certifying agency come back and say, oh, wait a minute, it looks like in your bylaws that the non-minority members who are the minority owners from a percentage standpoint have some powers some veto powers. And it was, you know, one of those standard provisions that you have in bylaws that says that you cannot make a decision without unanimous consent of all the owners, the shareholders and the members, et cetera. So just a, a point on that too, that you may need to, if you're in that category, do some modifications to your governance documents. All right, so I'm going to tee up a question that has nothing to do with taxes right now. Uh, this is, uh, we've got some PPP questions that came in uh, overnight. And so here's the scenario. Uh, they received 
uh, forgiveness on first round of PPP. They received their loan on May the 5th. They've depleted all the funds by just applying the money to payroll expenses. Uh, if we had used only PPP funding, we would have depleted the money on or around 7 11 20. Question is twofold, and, and I know this uh, company, um, they got over the 2 million, so they will be audited. They know that. And the question is twofold. What's the deadline to file and how should I file if I use the eight weeks or the 24 weeks looking for some assistance as we have had many issues with a notable very large bank here in Charlotte, North Carolina will remain unnamed. <laughs> Getting the loan forgiveness application started, I'm worried will be outside the window. So they could go and, and I did talk with them yesterday. They, um, they are up. Uh, over last year. So the ERC um, is probably not applicable. Uh, so we talked about initially, hey, allocating the 40% to, uh, you know, qualified expenses. So it, it, they spent it all on payroll. Uh, so the question is, is should they go eight weeks or 24 weeks? And if they do that, um, things that they should be considering. Yeah, I mean, you, if, if ERTC is not going to be a factor, you know, and, and you're not, you know, you're coming up against your deadline. So if ERTC is not going to be a factor, I would submit as fast as you can and just go the eight weeks if you had no other, you know, exceptions that are in there that you have to factor in because you're going to be on the um, easy, um, like you still got to have a whole bunch of other information that you've got to provide, but you're on the easy form. If that's not the case, you know, I might, you know, back into my covered period based on how long it will take me to get my stuff together um, for the final answer. Because you don't have, again, you don't have to pick eight or 24. You can pick some range um, in between there now with the guidance that came out. So I might pick, you know, set a deadline for myself to say, hey, I will have this application submitted by you know, June 15th, that means my cover period needs to be 10 weeks, you know, if I'm looking at the 10 month window, but if it was me, I really would rush to try to get my application done off my plate, um, you know, out of the, you know, out of the way, uh, if you can. Yeah, I yeah, think they you, were, you, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say they have, uh, you have 10 months from the end of your covered period to, uh, apply for get apply for forgiveness or else you start half the paying on that loan um now i don't know the answer to if you start paying and then you get forgiveness do you get it uh, paid you know paid back to you which i think it's it's meant to be a penalty to get your stuff in order and get it put in so it's unlikely that they would refund any amount that you paid on the loan um as far as paying it back over that period starting at that period of time essentially yeah, I think their worry was that they are outside of the eight week, 10 month, you know, covered the 10 month window after their covered period ended in eight weeks because they got a, they got funded early on. So and early on, we thought it was either eight weeks or 24 weeks. And what you're saying is you can you yeah. can pick between there. Yeah, that's right. And based on the, the set of facts, they're coming up against their first 10 month window if they went on the eight week period. So if you can get your crap together to get it all pulled together, I would do that. Ooh. All right. So I, I, Joe, thank you. Uh, hey, thanks to you guys received total PPP forgiveness and it was a pretty large amount. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and Joe. Hey, Joe, but, when do I get a ride in the Lamborghini? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those gold wing doors are su super cool. Uh, he did ask if we were getting into the entertainment business and if we we're looking for commercial advertisers. We're pretty simple. Uh, you know, you supply us with swag and we're probably good. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Uh, next question. Uh, I knew we could count on David uh, for some twists and really in intelligent questions. So here's the question. So software is a qualified expense for PPP forgiveness, but here's the twist. Oh, we knew it was coming. 
a subsidiary pays for software created by their parent company. The parent developed the software and owns it. Is this a PPP qualified expense or is it like a mortgage where the payments to related parties are forbidden? Yeah, so this is one where um, I, I, I'm on my uh, stand-up desk so I can actually see the questions instead of being on my iPad. So I got a chance to think about this one as it came in. But th this is one where um, Jack could be proud of me. Um, while technically allowed simply because it seems to be an issue that was not contemplated. <laughs> um, I think it's one of those where, man, if I had to testify in court on this one, or if I was on the front page of the Charlotte Business Journal um, based on it, I would not feel good about the answer. You know, local company gets rich off PPP dollars and lays off 10 people um, because they use their own so their own internally developed software expenses to get to their 40% number, you know, meanwhile, but it's like, and that just, I mean, again, it, it's, it, it, it's technically legal um, because it's silent <laughs> on, on that specific type of matter. And the only place that's rel like related is on the um, mortgage piece. So it just feels like, look, I mean, the intent there was to not, to not make yourself rich if you're a related party <laughs> off this. So it just, yeah, it's legal, but it doesn't smell good. <laughs> so I would say I'm going to give a very legal, detailed answer to this, which is it depends. <laughs> and it depends because, and I think, and again, this is the opinion of, Jack Santanello, not of the law firm or uh, actual legal advice, but I think that you know, if it's something that was an arm's length transaction, meaning it was market rate, that it wasn't fabricated at the time, maybe you have a, a prior history of paying this. And so if not to your own company, then to another company because you need that software, then I think there might be an argument for it. But when you start kind of playing games and get cute about it, um, I think that that's when there's going to be, be problems and some accountability as to exactly the scenario that Adam said that, okay, yeah, you got the money, but you, you know, you, you laid some people off, et cetera. So I think that, you know, if, if it seems legit, if it is legit, then you might have an argument, but I, I am not aware of, a uh, pronouncement similar to on the, the related party mortgage interest rent landlord tenant stuff that uh, would apply to an inter-party expense like this all right next question is from mike uh, michael i knew we could count on you uh, so he there are a couple of them first of all does covered supplier costs include cost of goods sold for customer orders existing prior to the covered period? Um, I mean, given, given that everything was accrual or cash, whatever was more favorable, it wasn't one or the other, you know, my, my feeling would be, yeah, because I mean, like if it was in your, if it was in your accounts payable at the beginning of your covered period, or if it was paid, whatever the rule was, um, you know, or, or if you got it um, and it was in your payables at the end of your cover period, I would think it's in there. I mean, that, that's consistent with every other piece of guidance that they've got um, in the forgiveness calculations. All right, next question is on form eligibility to use the 35008, uh, 3508 uh, easy instead of the long form for forgiveness. There's a question on the borrower was un unable to operate during the covered period at the same level of business activity as before February 15, due to guidance issued by the CDC related to COVID-19 wouldn't nearly every company meet this criteria? Yeah, that's what we would think. All right. 
I think we've got those that are covered that came in last night. Um, all right, so here's a, th this is a tax and trust issue. Uh, at this actual moment, I'm reading irrevocable trust agreement for my father to move some assets. What are the odds of the change being made retro? This is a new trust trying to get done in the next week. I mean, all you got on this one, it, so you got two things working with the estate tax law. You know, one is just the general history of what's happened in the past. And what's happened in the past with tax law changes generally is that there's only been one time since the 50s that a tax law change was retroactive. That was under Clinton. Um, and, and, it was, and, and they went all the way to like right now to then make it retroactive. But there's been nothing beyond kind of the June time frame that's ever passed that went retroactive. So my own feeling is that in general, any tax law changes are going to be prospective, not retroactive. I know there's a lot of people that are fear mongering out there, but I just don't see them being retroactive. Um, secondly, with respect to the estate tax law itself, um, you know, generally they've, they've either raised the limit or eliminated the limit. We're in kind of a weird situation where they're talking about reducing a limit. So I think all of us are pondering, well, what's going to happen if I gave away, like currently the limitation is $23 million and some change for a married couple reverting back to about 12 million bucks. Well, what if I already gave away the 23 million? Are they going to come back to 12 million? My, there's, there's been, you know, Nobody knows, but my speculation would be, no, it's going to be prospective going forward, just like everything else, because that, that would be, that would be so fraught with problems um, to try to figure out um, how, how and when gifts actually happened that I just feel like that's probably going to be prospective, not um, retroactive in terms of saying, you know, look, if you gave away 23 million, sorry, um, you're going to have to go, we're, you're going to have to go backwards. All right. The next question is, can you explain again how the proposed tax changes would affect S corps and K1 shareholders? Yeah. So, you know, really um, two places, you know, in an S corporation, there's always a balancing act between how much should I take as a reasonable wage and how much should I take in um, flow through income K-1 distributions? So right now, the K-1 distributions, you're only paying 80 cents on the dollar due to the qualified business income deduction. So if you make over 400 grand, they're talking about that being phased out and going away. So you'd pay full freight, not, not getting a 20% discount. Two is, you know, if you had, if you had set your W-2 wage to be more than 400, which we don't have a lot of clients that really do that in S corporations, but if you did, then north of 400, they're talking about phasing back in the social security tax at 12 and a half percent. It's already got the Medicare surtax and the, um, it's already got a couple little social security things on it, but they'd bring back the big social security tax north of 400, which I find um ironic at some levels in the sense that I'm never you know I'm really never going to collect that money like I I'd much rather instead of you taxing me today to get money that I never get when I retire just don't give me the money <laughs> give it to somebody else <laughs> that needs it <laughs> yeah um so the next question is, is where do we stand on NC North Carolina's taxation of PPP funds? Sorry, Joe, uh, as it stands right now, you're going to owe 40 grand that you didn't plan on. Unless they fix it in the next 15 days. <laughs> yeah. So I, I look to see just to make sure that nothing has happened. And then I actually pulled up the, the Senate bill and the house bill. Um, it is, 13 lines long, meaning 13 lines on an eight and a half by 11 page. And most of it is references to section numbers. And basically it says that, hey, 
we're going to do what the feds do on this particular issue. And that's simply what it says. And because I was thinking, okay, gosh, are they like drudging through a lot of language that in order to make this happen? And uh, no, I could read this to you in about 15 seconds or less as to what this says and for well, them to get it done. If they're following the feds, that would mean that it's deductible. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's, that's what the house bill said. And that's what the Senate bill, whatever it is, 112, um, that references the same House bill says. However, there was a Senate bill, I think it was Senate bill 334 or 344 or something like that, that came out um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago that is contrary to this one. So it's ridiculous. It's basically... It's a Senate bill that goes through every single decoupling provision. Decoupling is the technical, um, we're going to screw over the North Carolina taxpayers by not following the federal code, code word. Decoupling sounds so much, yeah, we're decoupling. <laughs> you know, states' rights, we're decoupling. No, that's another way of saying you're going to stick it to me. Because <laughs> decoupling never works in my favor. <laughs> decoupling always works against me. Oh, great. So much for getting the ride in the Lamborghini because he's already taken it back. Yeah, there, there, went, your, there went your Lambo, Joe. Sorry about that. <laughs> Dang, I wanted to get in that lime green one. It's this perfect color. Uh, all right, questions out there. Uh, you got free reign, hit us up. You got a couple experts ready and willing to give them your best shot so yeah it looks like we've got a couple hands up in the attendee list if anybody's got a question go ahead and type it in and we'll get an answer for you so in the meantime here's the question oh here we go i think i've asked but I did not claim PPP on 2020 tax returns. Do I have to do that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're on North. Yeah, so basically it's supposed to be in addition to your North Carolina income on your 2020 return. Because remember, what they decoupled was not the provision around um, claim as incurred, <laughs> not when forgiven. What they decoupled was the ability to deduct it. So it was supposed to be an add back to your 2020 um, North Carolina income, which is why we've been having all our clients hold on North Carolina um, until we get to the last minute. <laughs> so do, do we think it's going to be um, Sunday night at midnight on the 16th of May? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But I mean, again, if now that, you know, if, if everybody wants to get riled up on it, let me just go ahead and, you know, the current, again, I'm not kidding when I say, please write your, like look up who your Senator is and then blow up their email. Um, because, you know, kind of the argument is, oh, isn't there a double dipping? Um, and by double dipping, what it means is, look, you know, if I gave Jack money as a business owner, didn't I make Jack whole? Like you'd have had to pay taxes anyway. So let's go ahead and you know make him pay taxes on the money that I gave him. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> if I gave Jack a dollar and then Gary turned around and paid Gary that dollar and kept him employed, didn't put him on unemployment, kept him employed, Gary paid the taxes on the dollar through his North Carolina withholding. So if I tax Jack too, it's not Jack who's double dipping. It's the state of North Carolina that's double dipping. <laughs> so it's just ridiculous. They didn't look. They didn't look at it as it. That when when the when the um, when the scoring office for North Carolina came up with a well, we're going to lose six hundred million in revenue if we do this. They didn't look at it as a system. <laughs> they looked at it only from Jack's perspective. Not the fact that for Jack to have even been forgiven in the first place, he had to pay Gary, and Gary paid his taxes. So the no, money was right. Taxes. I did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions out there? So here's here's this week's trivia. <laughs> what 
week number is this of doing these doggone live Q and A's consecutively. Oh, uh, is that also not true for federal tax then? Yeah. So, I mean, federal tax. Yeah. So that's why they didn't, that's why they basically said, look, you can go ahead and deduct the expenses on the federal tax. So basically the I, the feds and 47 other states have said, you can go ahead and deduct expenses associated with what you spent the PPP funds on three states. I don't even know who the other two besides North Carolina, but three states have said, nah, <laughs> we're not going to let you do that. But we're pro business. So uh, we've got two guesses. <laughs> Joe uh, undershot by eight billion dollars on the tax liability, deferred tax liability of Duke Energy, uh, and he also overshot. Said this is week one thousand. Let's think yeah. about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> Robert was close, but no cigar. Robert estimated 60 weeks. <laughs> oh. Now, now you know, there's, there's actually two answers to this, right? There is when the actual beginning was, and then there was the point that I invited myself onto your show, oh, thinking that's it was true. only going to be a couple of days, and then here we are. So, that's true. You know, I think we should give prizes for either or both answers. Yeah. Okay. Well, in e either case, it wasn't a thousand and it wasn't 60. <laughs> oh, did we deduct for the holidays we took off? No, we, we, ca we counted them. Yeah, yeah, we did take off for um, Christmas. Uh, we did get a legitimate question in here, though. I must have missed something then because my assumption is that I will owe federal tax on the PPP yeah. loan. And because I can say this with love, uh, John, you will not owe uh, tax on the PPP loan. That was part of the correction they made um, at the tail end of last year. And I would have thought that Elliot Davis would have told you that by this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I better get a laughing emoji to that, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> all right uh sizzler you're going to sizzler tonight i don't know what the sizzler is i know that there was a oh, the sizzler it's great they got the chocolate water water fountain it's beautiful kids love it is is that like the western sizzling it's, it's like a golden corral oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah yeah, the, the, the chocolate fountain. There are no germs come, you know, in that thing. No way. No, not one bit. No. <laughs> chocolate kills all germs, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that, cho that chocolate's coming out at 140 degrees, which kills all bacteria. No, it is not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when people put their hand in it and lick it and then put in the hand again, that's probably not a good thing to do. I don't know. Just saying. Um, also, sneeze guards are not built for kids level, just saying. No. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we could go off on a complete tangent on that one. Um, any other questions out there and any other guesses? Like I said, you know, Joe was the furthest off at a thousand weeks. No, we haven't done a thousand weeks. Robert was really close at 60. So and I'll give you a hint. It's the same number of my birthday this week. <laughs> Not 60. <laughs> wow, that sounded like an, a, a, um, an inadvertent su uh, subconscious way yeah. of getting some swag and gifts there, Gary. Oh, yeah, that was a hey. shop early shop off. I hadn't thought about that, but you know, I'd be all, all into that. Um, <laughs> all right any other questions out there hit us up and we will plan on being back i'm going to be at the beach with some family not socially distanced with my family 
uh, and I'll be excited about that. Um, but I'm planning still on being part of this crazy train. This is fun. It's uh, I always look forward to it and always learn stuff. And I also believe that we are actually helping a few people. So um, if anybody dialed in late, we'll put this thing up on the YouTube, uh, the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on this afternoon. And um, anyway, thank you for great questions, David. You know, you always have these really interesting twists, so keep bringing those. Um, Robert, thanks for being on here. Joe, thanks for harassing us. Um, John, consider what uh, Adam said. <laughs> <laughs> you got a friend. I don't know. I don't, I don't, th I don't think they've been on uh, for um, almost 60 consecutive weeks, but, you know, yeah. I haven't been checking their YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> All right. Any any final words from Jack or Adam or anybody else out there? Um, only, you know, hey, it's not, you know, it's not panic time yet on the tax rates. That's probably about it. Okay. Yeah, and I would I would reiterate your ask of the group that, you know, are there topics that you want us to cover, you know, as we kind of wind down, well presumably wind down the discussion on PPP and everything else, but, you know, happy to go into other topics because it's been in very interesting to see uh, the, the outreach, the reach that, you know, this particular format has provided. And so happy to continue providing that. And I know Adam and Gary are as well. So let us know what you want to hear about. Yep. Yeah, we are actually, um, energized by the ability to serve people. And it's clearly not just our clients that are on here, which is fantastic. Um, we care about the business community out there because you guys are the ones keeping people employed out there. So we care about that whole thing in our community. So uh, if we can continue to help strengthen that, that's what we're all about here. So I can say that unequivoc unequivocally, <laughs> I can't even say it. <laughs> so, um, all right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign us off. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. It's beautiful out there. Uh, enjoy this Charlotte springtime weather. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate both Thank of you. you. See y'all. Bye-bye. Cool. Thanks.